Good morning, church. It's a great day to be in God's house. Uh, if you are visiting with us, let me say this. We're glad you're here. If you are not visiting and you are a, a faithful week to week, we're glad you're here too. It's going to be a great day uh, this morning. Uh, but to begin, I want to acknowledge um, our veterans. And so if you are a veteran, would you mind standing this morning? There we go. And so we want to say this. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, it is a blessing, and we appreciate you far more than words could ever describe. And so all of our veterans, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Amen. Well, by way of announcement, I want to uh, remind you that our, this coming Sunday night, our th- we're going to have our Thanksgiving dinner. And so if you haven't signed up for that, you can register out in the lobby at the Welcome Center or you can get online, uh, register that way. Uh, also, Operation Christmas Child Boxes. Next Sunday is the last Sunday to return those here at the church. So if you've taken a box and you've been putting some goodies in there, make sure you bring that back by Sunday. Also, we are so close to the holidays. It, is, it seems like this year just got started. And here it is about to close out. Uh, But if you haven't registered yet for Holly Jolly Christmas Experience, Micah Tyler is going to be here. That is going to be a great night, December the 11th. Make sure you get online and reserve your tickets. And so here we are, church, together, joined together. We're going to worship. We're going to open up God's Word. But that started all off with a word of prayer. Bow with me, if you will. (laughs) Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you today thankful that we can be here, uh, thankful for so many good things in our lives, thankful that we have the freedom to be able to come and to worship. Uh, Thankful for those that have given um, their lives, their time, made sacrifices, those that are still uh, sacrificing for our country. Lord, we are uh, appreciative to be able to live in in a great land, and we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so, God, today I pray that we would block out distraction, that we would be able to focus on who you are, on your goodness, that we would be reminded that we are to have hearts full of gratitude. And so, God, this morning may we lift up your name. May we grow in you, learn in you. May we leave here different than when we arrived. God, once again, we praise you for your goodness. Be with us today. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Church, would you stand your feet? Let's worship the Lord together.
God we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Magnificent God is also the God of the mundane. And whether, whether there are big things going on in your life, there are small things going on in your life, God is in control. Perhaps you're here today, there's just been struggle after struggle, and maybe there's something that, that you can't just seem to, you can't get through that doorway. Listen, God is, God is famous for getting through doors nobody else can get through. He's, he's, he's famous for opening doors that no one else can open. And he wants to do that for you. I hope that you'll, you'll trust him and believe in him and rely on him as, the, as your provider, as your healer, as your savior. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are all those things and more. God, we trust in you. We rest in you. Lord, you are, you are God forever. And we trust you and we thank you. Lord, we, we trust in you for all things. There's someone here today, they've never come to the place of saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. That's the greatest need they could ever have. It's the greatest need that they could ever feel is the, is the need for salvation. I pray that today they would say, Jesus, come into my heart. We love you. Be with us as we continue in worship in Jesus' name.
thousand stories of why they think you're like a lion. The tender whisper of love in the dead of night as you tell that you're pleased and that I'm never
Jesus in the street 
Good morning, church. A great time of worship through song. Amen. I tell you what, I'm glad I don't have to sing after Laura Roberts. But I'm thankful that I get to preach after her because it just really sets the table. You know, we have so many talented people in our church that, that they don't just sit on that talent, they use it. And I'm willing to, to bet that there are many of us here today that have talent that just is, is waiting to be put into to use. And so I encourage you to use your talents for the Lord. Now, as we begin this morning, I want to start off with a question, and it's this. Do you ever think about what you think about? Do you ever think about what you think about? In psychology, that is referred to as metacognition. It's awareness and understanding of our own thought processes. And it's interesting that at, that at times throughout the day, different things pop into our minds and we can redirect those thoughts and we have conversations with ourselves. You do have conversations with yourself, right, church? You know, that's normal, right? You know, that's what thinking is, is having conversations in your own mind. But we are able to challenge our thinking and to confront our emotions. But maybe at times, you even wonder what other people are thinking. Now, let me ask you this, ladies. Sometimes, don't you just wonder, what's going on in his head? Let me tell you, there's probably not a whole lot. Uh, us guys tend to kind of be, you know, one, one track, one thing at a time. But gentlemen, have you ever asked this question? I just wonder what my wife is thinking right now. And the answer to that question is more than you could possibly imagine. Uh, so much going on in our heads. But sometimes even while I'm preaching, I wonder what's going on in, in your mind. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had those little thought bubbles where everybody could see what you were thinking? Doesn't that sound terrifying to you? Uh, that's a huge pass for me. Well, today I want to talk about uh, something I'm calling thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Giving. Uh, have you heard of that term before? You probably haven't because I just invented it. And uh, if it gets any amount of notoriety, I want my, you know, my dividends on that. Thanksgiving. Uh, of course, you haven't heard of it. It's a term I only made up this week. But today, we are getting very near the end of the book of Philippians. And next week, we'll close out Philippians. And then I'm excited about something that we're going to move into for the Advent season, for Christmas holidays. Uh, but today, I want us to see a connection between uh, thankfulness and our thinking. Now, last Sunday, you had my good friend, Brian, the man, Bozeman. Uh, he, he preached, and didn't he do a remarkable job? Uh, absolutely, he did. And he challenged us in the book of Daniel to be people of integrity. And integrity is the idea that uh, who you are when no one else is around is who you are when you're around other people. And last time I checked, no one else is around in your head besides you and God. Now, sometimes we forget that God is there, that he knows our thoughts. There is nothing that God does not know. He knows it all. He knows our innermost thoughts. But I want to ask you this morning, does your integrity even extend into your thought life? Where what goes on in your mind, you would be fine if other people knew the thoughts that you think. So today we're going to talk a lot about thinking but two weeks ago when I was last with you, we worked through the, uh, the first part of Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We're going to pick up in verse 6 today. And Paul talked in those verses about standing firm, that Christians should live stable lives, and he gave us some ways to do that. And that sort of continues on in the passage we're looking at today. He really drills down into thankfulness, gratitude, but also our thinking, something I like to mash up together and call thanksgiving. And so if you have your Bibles, God's Holy Word, let's open those together. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at four verses today, verses 6 through 9. And I thought we might read it and then break it down together. So let's jump in. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says, finally, brothers, and of course we extend this to our sisters, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, it's pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything that is worthy of praise, he says to think about these things. He goes on, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Now this week, as I was thinking about this passage, see what I did there? And as I was, you know, preparing, and I was, in my own mind, thinking about the thoughts that can compete for time in my thought life, I wondered, what do other people think about? And so I got on social media, and I put this little poll out there. What are the top three things that you think about on a daily basis? And it was interesting to me to hear people's responses. I want to share a few that sort of uh, were similar because, believe it or not, we kind of all think about the same things pretty regularly, a few deviations. Uh, So I asked the poll, what are the top three things that you think about the most? Here's some answers that were held in common. Uh, One was food. Now, do you think about food very often? I like to think about food, as in what's for lunch, what's coming. That was a common one. Another common one that we think about was work. What do I need to get done? What's my to-do list? What am I behind on? Et cetera, et cetera. One person even said in their top three thoughts of the day, they think, how can I aggravate my pastor? (laughs) Now, I'm not going to tell you who said that for the sake of confidentiality. So Becky Westmoreland, your secret is safe with me. So a lot of people think about family. Is my family okay? Am I doing right by them? How can I help them? Am I raising my kids right? A lot of people thought about the future. Uh, Their health, finances was high on the list. God and spiritual life was also high on the list. You know what, friends? We do a lot of thinking. In fact, you process roughly 70,000 thoughts a day. Now here's the truth. Some of our thought life is healthy. That's great. Hooray. Some of our thought life is not. Some of us have stinking thinking. Some of us have negative self-talk. Some of us have negative thoughts about other people. Some of us have negative filters that we run our thinking through. Now, here is the truth. God has called us to think specifically, as we'll see in our passage today, because our thought life is truly a battlefield. And as strange as it sounds, we cannot be passive in our thought life. If we let our thoughts run away from us, they will take us places that we need not go. And so Paul begins with one specific problem of thought, and he mentions anxiety. And so if you're taking notes, our first thought this morning is anxious thinking. Anxious thoughts are destabilizing. So many what-ifs. What if this happens? What if this might happen? Often we miss out on the future. We miss out on the present because we're so consumed with the future. And so what does Paul say? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says this, Do not be anxious about anything. Now, do you know what the word anything there means? It means anything. He says, don't be anxious about anything. As to say, a Christian should not be given to anxiety. Now, let me say this. As many of you know, I I have a background in psychology. I've spent many years practicing as a, a licensed professional counselor. And I'm well acquainted with what is referred to as clinical anxiety. Now, Paul is not making light of mental health here. Uh, Sometimes anxiety is caused by physical problems in our brains, and those physical problems contribute to anxious thoughts. Medication helps that at times if it's a physical problem. The Bible is not anti-medication. But here is what the Bible says, that regardless, we still have a responsibility for what goes on in here. That we are responsible for our thought life, but we should also understand this. That when we worry, or when we think certain thoughts continually over and over and over, did you know this? That thinking rewires your brain, and that rewiring makes you more likely to have a proclivity to continue in that sort of thought pattern. So the more our thinking goes contrary to what God says, the easier it is to think those sort of thoughts. It's amazing how our brains work. But Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. A Christian should not be ruled by their thoughts. Now, we may have a propensity or a bent toward worry or anxiety, but we shouldn't be ruled by those thoughts. Now, 
Paul is echoing the teachings of Jesus. I want to read to you what Jesus said about this very topic. I'm going to go to Matthew 6, verse 25. I'll read it to you because we're going to stay in Philippians. He says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about your body, what you'll wear. He says, Isn't life not more than food and the body more than clothes? So Jesus says, don't worry. Now he, now he isn't saying this. He isn't saying that you don't attend to details that need to be attended to. He says, don't worry about your health. That isn't, to, that isn't to say that you ignore your health. That's foolish. But Jesus says we shouldn't be given to worry about health or physical attributes or food or drink or clothes. He goes on to verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. They don't punch a clock every day or store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, he asked this rhetorical question, are you not much more valuable than they? He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Then he skips down in verse 34 and he says this. He says, therefore... Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is the future. Don't worry about the future, for the future will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that is an amen, right? We have struggles from day to day. Now, here's what's interesting to me. In 2,000 years, the things we worry about and fret over haven't really changed. We struggle with the same things people struggled with 2,000 years ago. And as people, we have this tendency to worry and to ask what ifs, is it all going to work out and be okay? Now here's my rub with with modern day psychology. Psychology says, oh, you're anxious. You're anxious because things are out of your control. So what we need to do is, is we got to put you back in control. We've got to have you take responsibility for what you can control so you won't feel anxious. Now don't get me wrong, there is some value there. But here's where it gets hard. What do you really have control over? What can you control? I think really it boils down to a few things. You can control your thought life. You can control what you do. And you can control your environment to some degree. You can wash the dishes and make your bed. But largely, much of life is outside of our control. You can't control other people. Some of us exhaust immeasurable energy trying to control other people because we feel out of control ourselves. You can't control the future. You can't control what's going to happen. You can't control the stock market. You can't control the country. You can have a vote, but that's about all you get. So much is outside of our control. So psychology says, oh, you're out of control? Well, we got to get you back in control. Christianity says this, oh, you feel out of control? That's because largely things in your life are outside of your control. However, You know the person intimately who is in control. And so we lean into that person, and it's here that Paul really drills down into what we're calling this morning thanksgiving. You see, thanksgiving is the antidote to anxiety. Thanksgiving brings spiritual stability. Now, what is thanksgiving? Well, this morning we're going to look at three things. Thanksgiving is prayer. It's gratitude and it's intentionality of thought. It's prayer, it's gratitude, and it's intentionality of thought. Look at verse 6. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Now, years ago, uh, if you remember, it's been a while, there was the Bob Newhart show. And Bob was a, a therapist, and this lady comes in for counseling. And she says, here's the list of my problems. I tend to be anxious. I worry about this. Um, You know, I tend to be sad. I fear that other people don't like me. I have this recurring uh, fear that I'm going to be buried in a box in the backyard. And Newhart's taking notes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He writes all of it down. And he says, all right, are you ready for my, my clinical opinion? She says, yeah. He says, you struggle to control your thoughts. Yes, I do. You, you worry that you're going to be buried in a box in the backyard. Yes. You fear that other people don't like you. Yes. He says, well, stop it. Don't do that. He says, quit or I'm going to bury you in a box in the backyard. (laughs) Now, when you read Paul's, when you read the text, it kind of sounds like that. He says, don't be anxious about anything. It sounds like he's saying, stop it. But this is the amazing thing to me about Scripture, is it always equips us 
when we need to handle something in our life. And so from here on out, Paul does exactly that. He says, oh, you struggle with your thought life? Here's how we manage that. Verse 6, by, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So Paul says, first of all, that we should pray. Paul says, in every situation, we pray. In fact, he's really redundant here. He says, pray, pray, pray. He says, he uses three words. He says, prayer. He says, supplication. And he says, request. All of those are just a different word for pray. So Paul says we can replace anxious thoughts, or really any problematic thought, with prayer. When we feel out of control, we can speak to the one unhampered who is in control. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that if you're, having, if you're struggling with thoughts and you pray that, boom, anxiety is going to evaporate. But here is what I'm saying, and I think Paul is saying, and this is what I've learned. This is a discipline that takes practice. And remember that word practice because Paul's going to use it in verse 9. That this is a discipline that takes practice. In my own personal life, I tend to be more of a worrier, more of an anxious person. And I have learned over the years, and God has been so faithful to drive this point home in my mind, that when I'm prone to worry, I replace that with prayer, and I keep praying. Scripture says to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean you pray all day long. It means you're constantly connected with God. Sometimes I say three-second Geronimo amen prayers in the moment. But it means being honest. It means telling God what you're truly worried about, that you pour it out to Him. And here is what I have found out as I have learned to practice this discipline of prayer. That there's been a many a night where I have a concern And instead of laying in bed worrying and not getting sleep, I bring those petitions to God. And in that moment, I find peace and I find rest because he's in control and I'm not. Paul goes on, how do we practice thanksgiving? He says that we are thankful, that we should be thankful, that we practice gratitude. Look at verse 6. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving giving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, we pray, but we do it with thanksgiving. That means I don't come to God resentful and say, God, why this? Why don't I have that? Why did you let this in my life? Why are you letting me struggle? Why can't things be this way? Let me remind us, why are we here? God. Why do we have every amazing blessing in our life? Because of God. Why do we get life in the first place? Because of God. Why is Josh Fultz not going to bust the hell wide open after this life is over? Well, that would be because of God. What is the source of every good thing in my life? That's God. How did we get the good, the true, the beautiful? Why do I have a future? All of that is because of God. So how can I come to God with anything but gratitude? Because he's been so incredibly good. And often, friends, we blame God for things that God is not responsible for. Now, God can handle it. He's got on his big boy pants. He can handle it. But so often, we blame him for things that aren't his. God, why are you letting me suffer for my bad decisions? That ain't God's fault. You want to know who's responsible for that? I look in the mirror. That's why sometimes I suffer for my decisions. But, you know, sometimes even in God's grace, he curtails those consequences from my, my, my sowing. Sometimes we ask God, God, why do you let things into my life? You know, I've been tempted to ask, and have probably asked before, to be honest. God, why have you let our kids be sick? Let me tell you what, that's not God's fault. The fact is, we live in a broken, fallen world, and sin has affected their lives just like it's affected mine, and it affects our bodies. It affects everything about creation. Creation rests under this curse because of sin. But here is the thing. God says we can present our request to him. We can bring him anything. We can petition and we can ask. And I think sometimes the biggest 
things missing from our theology of prayer is thanksgiving and persistence. Coming to God with a heart of gratitude and coming repeatedly because it keeps us connected with God. Because a heart of gratitude, it takes what we have and it makes it enough. Perseverance keeps us going back to the Father who loves us. Now here's what I want us to know. God does not always answer our prayers in the way that we want. He doesn't always fix the immediate problem. He doesn't always remove whatever is causing us to suffer. But what he does do is he gives us his presence and we have to trust that he knows best. But so much of it boils down to this question, or at least it does for me. It's in your worship, God. It says this, do I really believe that what I believe is really real? Do I really believe that what I believe is really real? That is to say, do I trust who God says he is? Why are we Christians? Just for the practical benefits? No, we're Christians because we believe it's true. Because it is true. But do I really trust it? Paul says, petition God, bring him your request, come with a thankful heart, and trust that he knows best and that he'll work. And if we're able to do that, we're reminded of 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, cast all your anxiety on him. Why is that? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. Do I really believe that what I believe is really real? Christian, I want to remind you of something. You can endure scary things if you know everything's going to be all right. You can endure scary things if you know everything is going to be okay. And if you're in Christ, everything will be okay. Let me give you an illustration. Roller coasters can be scary. Are there any roller coaster people in here? My family enjoys them. We, we, we love a, a thrilling, scary-to-death ride. But I remember the first time... Me and Devin took Hadley and Hayden. Holland was just little. We took them to, to Disney World. And we thought, we'll just start off with the scariest roller coasters. That way, everything else will seem mild. It seemed like a great plan. So we put Hadley on the ride. She was terrified, so we had to stop it before it even got started. But she wanted to ride it so bad. So finally, she mustered up the courage. She rode it. She was terrified. She said, let's do it again. So after four or five times, she started to understand, when I ride this, I feel out of control. When I ride this, it is terrifying, but I'm going to be okay. We're going to get to the end of the ride. We're going to go home and we're going to sleep in our beds tonight. And then from there, we rode even scarier roller coasters as time would unfold. Now, here's the application. When we understand that God is there, And when we trust him implicitly, when we cast our cares on him knowing that he knows best, it doesn't matter how scary the ride gets. It doesn't matter how much we feel out of control. It doesn't matter what the news is. It's going to be okay. And so Paul says from that, look what happens in verse 7. He says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we pray, when we bring our request to God, when we allow prayer to replace our spinning minds, when we're thankful for what we have, Paul says we experience the peace of God. And this is why for so many people, their ride is bumpy, it's full of trials and challenges, and people say, how can you be at peace at a time like this? Because of what we see in Scripture. And here Paul is even envisioning times where our circumstances aren't changed, where the solution doesn't come immediately to the problem, yet we can still have peace in the chaos. Verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds In Christ Jesus. Paul goes on. How do we practice and experience thanksgiving? Let's look at intentionality of thought. Anxious thoughts must be replaced with prayer and thanksgiving, and we have to think very specifically and intentionally with our minds. That is to say, our thoughts obey us. We don't obey our thoughts. 
But let me remind you of this. If we are passive in our thinking, we will be slaves to things like anxiety or insecurity or pleasing people or lust or bitterness or ingratitude. The battle rages on in our minds. Why is that? Because sin has come into the world and it has corrupted everything in creation, including the way that we think. So listen to what Paul says in verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. He says, think on these things. This is saying, be intentional about what you think about. Now, as we near closing, I want to point out a couple of things. One is this, that we are the product of our thought life. We are the product of our thought life. Here's what Jesus said. Let me read this to you quickly. Mark 7, 20 through 23. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, inverse, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So Jesus is saying, what is in here always comes out. Thousands of years before this, the wisest man in the world, Solomon, would write in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, what you think about, because from that, everything flows out into your life. We are a product of our thought life. So Paul says in verse 8, he says, Christian, you better think about the right things. He says, dwell on these, and that means to evaluate, to consider, to calculate. It's intentional. How's your thinking, Christian? Now, I have in my notes what each one of these words means, but time is going to inhibit us from looking at this. So go home, read Philippians 4, 8, and ask yourself, what does it mean to think on what's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise? You know, Christians are to be thinking people. And we're to think on the right kinds of things. Real quick, I know you're thinking, okay, it's like three minutes till 12 and we've got one more point. This is a small point. Paul says this, he says, practice. Look at verse 9. He says, what you have learned, what he has written, what we have garnished, garnered from that, what you have learned and received and heard and what you've seen in me, Paul says, practice these Things. What's the result of that? The God of peace will be with you. So much of Christianity is about taking the knowledge and the doctrine and the theology that we get in Scripture and putting it into daily habitual practice. You don't get an amazing golf swing from going to the range every six months and hitting a few golf balls. It's something you have to practice daily until you get the muscle memory built and it becomes a part of your life. This is the exact same thing with what Paul is saying. He's saying practice these things. Practice prayer. Practice gratitude. Practice being intentional with your thoughts. And if you practice that over and over and over and over again, the promise is you will experience both the peace of God and the God of peace. And we see again Paul saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So as we close this morning, church, I want to ask you just a couple of questions. We always want to take what we learn and, and make it practical in our lives. Is there something you're worrying about right now? Are you anxious about things? Could be anything. Can I remind you, even when we feel out of control, that you know the one who is in control, that you know the God of peace, so trust him and rest in him. Let me ask you this. How's your prayer life? This is what I know about me. When my prayer life suffers, my Bible reading suffers, what goes on in here is incredibly hard to manage. And what goes on in here spills out and it affects my family, it affects my wonderful co-workers, and it affects everyone else in my path. So how's your prayer life? Church, can I ask you this too? How's your gratitude? Are you living a life of thankfulness? Because when it all boils down, I should never honestly gripe. Because my life is so good in so many ways, and God has been good to me. How's your gratitude? What about this church? How is your thought life? Maybe you're letting your thought life control you. 
And you really need to take control of your thought life. It could be anything. It could be worry. It's one thing Paul points out today. It could be bitterness against someone else. And that's ruling your life because you think about it a lot. It could be something that you're angry about that you haven't resolved. And you need to have a conversation. And you need to fix some things because that anger is driving the ship. It could be lust. You know, we talk about sexual ethics a lot in pornography. You can create pornography in your mind by letting your thoughts get out of control. How is your thought life? What do you need to do to fix that? Maybe it's talk to someone else. Maybe it's confess it to God. Maybe it's to be intentional and to dwell on the things that we should be dwelling about. Christians, let's celebrate and let's practice thanksgiving let's pray together heavenly father we come before you today i pray with hearts of gratitude and i know lord i'm so tempted sometimes to look at circumstances to look at things going on in the world and to focus on that but lord would you create in me a new heart would you create in me a heart that is bursting with gratitude that instead of looking at the negative that i see the positives that it spills over into the lives of the people around us. Lord, what if we were truly joyous people because we have such hearts of gratitude? Lord, I pray that you would work in each of us to change and control and be intentional about what we think about. Lord, we want you to know that we love you. We praise you. Lord, we are thankful that we're here, that we have a future of hope. God, we're thankful for your goodness. Lord, would you be with us as we go throughout the rest of this week? And I pray that we would take time to reflect on your goodness. And maybe we share that with the people around us because they need it just as much as we do. Lord, we love you. Be with us. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.
church, go out with, with the confidence this week that God will never fail you. You'll never walk out the door. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. We appreciate it. Have an awesome week.